If you want freedom and ease from your anxiety, check out the powerful safe system for social anxiety over at quietbegins.com. Life presents the toughest challenges. Every day you are faced with decisions that test your ability to express who you really want to be in this world. We're told to keep saying affirmations and keep thinking positively, but what do you do when that stuff doesn't work? Welcome to the Overwhelmed Brain, where you'll learn to make decisions that are right for you so that you can create the life you want now. Hello and welcome to the show. This is Paul Coliani and I am here to help you increase your emotional intelligence so that you can avoid dysfunction, handle toxic situations with grace and ease, and show up as your authentic self. Everything I talk about on the show is my personal opinion and is meant for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult a medical or psychological professional before making any changes that could affect your physical or mental health. And I think that applies quite a bit today because... There's something I learned in Neuro Linguistic Programming, aka NLP, that really changed my perception of our personality, um, our behavior, our communication, and how we feel, how we experience emotions, how we think. I mean, there's a lot in NLP that I learned, but one of the things I learned was called a parts integration. And uh, if you've ever heard of multiple personality disorder, which they don't even recognize or use anymore, I don't think they use that term. It's something else. I don't even want to look it up. It's something else. I think it's called um, dissociative identity disorder. I think that's it. And uh, it was a mental disorder that apparently many people experienced. And uh, in NLP, we it wasn't called multiple personality disorder, but we referred to what is known as parts of ourselves or parts of our psyche, parts of our personality. It's sort of like, and this is my personal interpretation, who we are when we are doing certain things or behaving a certain way. And you might look at that in a way like when you are having a temper tantrum, you're really upset, that could be like a child part of you. Or when you are in work mode, that could be sort of like a business professional part of you. And when you're a parent and you're being parental to your children, that could be the mom part of you or the dad part of you, the parent part of you. And there are also um, other parts of you that uh, could take over at certain times. For example, um, I think of the executives of a big corporation extorting or taking money out of other people's retirement funds. This happened a long time ago. Well, not that long ago in a big company where I think most of the accounting team were stealing people's IRA. Extortion is the wrong word, but they were stealing people's IRAs. And so when these people finally retired, they had no money. I forget which company it was. It was a big scandal. Uh, but you could look at the people who stole as having a part of them that became greedy and it was the whatever greedy part the point is that we can have these parts of us and some people don't agree with this so i'm not saying that this is fact but uh, we can have these parts of us that take over and if we're not aware of those parts of us that are taking over then they could run our life and we could have for example the child part of us running our life the whole time we don't even realize it because it is us. I am that child. That child is me. I am that mom. That mom is me. I am that dad. I am that business executive. I am that leader. I am this. I am that. And when we understand that there may be a part of ourselves that's running the show, it can, it can help us to change and even talk to that part that helps us uh, gain a better understanding of ourselves, heal from old traumas and wounds, and even get into a new space so that we don't let that part uh, drive the bus anymore. <laughs> I've heard that term too. Who's driving the bus? Who's running the show? Who's running your life? And so I'm approaching this carefully because this may not be your belief system. This may not exist in your realm. But be open to it for a moment. 
You know, in NLP, I learned that integration of all these parts is probably the best way to live so that you feel completely integrated at the subconscious level so that you feel like you are a whole person. And this feeling of being a whole person helps you function in life and gives you access to all the resources that you need instead of accessing a part of you to grab that resource. It's a little abstract, I realize, but uh, just bear with me for a moment because um, the email I received kind of gets into this. This person wrote me an email and said that he's in therapy or has been in therapy that talked about the parts of himself. And he said it's been very helpful. And it reminded me of my days in NLP and how we did what was known as a parts integration, where we took a part of ourselves that we might have been in conflict with and integrated that into ourselves at the deepest level. And it is very powerful. If you've never gone through anything like this, it can be very, very powerful. It's one of the most powerful techniques I learned in NLP. It's not something that I'm going to walk you through on the air because it can like shift you like in a crazy way. <laughs> it can put you in a transcendent sometimes state uh, where your life can change dramatically. So I'm not saying that this is a cure-all for anything, but some people that have a conflict with a part of themselves can really benefit from some sort of parts integration like that. And I will share with you today how it's done. I won't walk you through it, but I'll give you the sort of basic instructions on how it's done so that you can try it yourself and see if it causes a change in you. But we'll get to that. I'm going to read that email that'll, that goes along with this and we'll get to that part. But um, the reason I'm mentioning this is because it is one of the most powerful techniques that I've ever experienced. I've had it done on me. I've done it with several clients. And every time I do it, their life changes. It magically, something happens inside of them and they no longer have conflict in themselves, at least with that particular area. And the way you can tell that a part of you might be in conflict with something that's going on in your life is using the words, a part of me feels like I shouldn't do this. I mean, th not those exact words every time, but if you've ever had the thought or said to yourself, a part of me doesn't want to do this, or a part of me thinks that I should do something else. If you have that sense, that thought, then you may have a part that's in conflict at the subconscious level that isn't integrated. It might not be the best term to use right now as I explain this, but when you integrate these parts into your system, into your psyche, then you no longer have the conflict and you reach closure or resolution or a new level of being or thinking. And being in that space, you aren't held back from doing the things that you want to do in your life. You don't feel trepidatious in your decision making. You trust yourself more. You understand yourself more. You know more. Because now these parts of you are talking. Now, let me just put a little disclaimer here. That doesn't mean you have multiple personality disorder or that dissociative identity disorder. It's not like that at all. I'm not here to tell you if you do or you don't. If you do, then you certainly talk to somebody about it uh, or if you think you do. What I'm here to talk about is um, just the basic language that you use can help you identify what's going on inside of you. And it's, it, it's very difficult to identify our own language when we're in it. You know, it, you can't see oxygen when you're breathing it. Uh, you can't really hear yourself when you're subconsciously streaming thoughts unless you start paying attention. When you start paying attention to your own language, wow, why do they say it that way? What is that about? What's behind what, why I'm saying it that way? You can start to understand yourself better. It takes a while, but you can catch yourself in certain language patterns. So when I say, you know, I really want to do that, but a part of me says that's probably not a good idea. All right, when you catch yourself saying something like that, you can stop and talk to that part. Hey, part, or whatever you want to call it, uh, why don't you want to do that? What's causing you to think that? That's the most basic version of talking to your parts. Again, that doesn't mean you are multiple personality. I'm just saying that it's an interesting approach 
that you use your language to your advantage. And when you hear the language, there's a part of me that this or that, then talk to that part because you're saying that there's a part of you. If you're saying it, then there must be something inside of you that feels differently. And okay, let's talk to that part. Now we're going to get into the more detailed aspects of this after the break. Uh, But I wanted to make this little introduction just to get you comfortable with the idea that there might be a different part of your personality or psyche or even compartmentalized thought processes inside of you that aren't necessarily in agreement. (laughs) They're, They're not necessarily going with the flow like the rest of you. They might have resistance to certain things. And I use this to my advantage all the time. If I feel 100% on board with something, then I can look at myself and say, every part of me wants to do this. And that feels good. I don't feel any resistance. I feel like I can just do this, see what happens, succeed or fail, and you know, at least I'm going forward. But if I have that little bit of hesitation and I think to myself, mm, I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure. That means, in my mind, a part of me wants to do it, and a part of me doesn't. Now I'm going to talk to myself. Now I'm going to be my own coach, my own therapist, my own parent, my own best friend, and just ask myself questions. Why are you hesitating? What's wrong? What's going on? And that can be very helpful. And if you're not in practice, if you're not used to doing that, it can take a while to understand what questions to ask because you're still in your stuff. You're still in the same space of the problem while trying to solve the problem. What's that Einstein quote? It's perfect here. Hang on. Here it is. We can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. And uh, I think of that quote and apply it to myself because in order to change your thinking, sometimes you have to change how you've been for the past life, (laughs) your entire life. Sometimes you have to change who you've been, how you've been, and become a different person, you know, metaphorically. Just become a different person to think differently. This is why it's helpful to have a third-party perspective of what's going on because we've been in our own thinking, and if it's been any type of dysfunctional thinking or unhealthy or unhelpful thinking, then we can't really use that same thinking to solve the problem. Usually it requires a shift. Parts integration that I'm talking about can be a shift. Healing from old trauma, from old wounds, therapy, coaching, any type of self-help that really makes you think differently about your problem is what creates the shift. Or at least that is one thing that can help create a shift. Once you have that shift in thinking, oh, now you can solve the problem or at least get closer to a resolution. But boy, when we're in that old style thinking, our old patterns, the patterns that have not helped us up to this point with something that we're working on, now we need some sort of brand new paradigm, something totally different that uh, we may not have access to, at least not right away, until we realize, well, the way I think doesn't help. The way I think, the way I process, the way I handle things isn't working. That's a great thing to admit. Imagine being able to admit that the way I do things doesn't work. That feels like failure. I know when I say it out loud, it feels like failure. The way I do things doesn't work. But what would happen if you finally accepted that maybe there's something that you're doing that doesn't work and you need a radical shift in thinking, a radical change in your perception. And if you had that, you'd be able to resolve whatever problems going on in your life. I can't get past this old trauma in my life. I need it resolved. What do I do? Well, when you're in the trauma, when you're in that post-traumatic stress, it's very difficult to get out of it because now you want to see it uh, from an objective space and be able to resolve it, but you can't do it because you're in it. It's sort of like asking you to not feel sad that someone you love died. It's hard to get out of that space. Because you're involved, you're immersed, it's a part of you. And that part of you is suffering. How do we disconnect long enough just to be able to heal, just to be able to process differently? Well, that's 
sort of what we're getting into today, not very deeply. It's usually best one-on-one, but knowing this about yourself or having an idea about what's going on inside of you to help you step outside yourself, outside your old thought patterns, your old thinking can help you perceive things differently, can also dissociate you from the suffering. Dissociation is when we're not in it, but we're observing it. That's not the whole definition, but if you can picture yourself 20 feet over there as that person is suffering over there and you're observing that person, which is you, but you're over there, then you might have a different feeling about that suffering. Hey, look at Paul over there suffering. That poor guy. So I'm Paul, but I'm 20 feet away from this Paul over there who's suffering. But now I have a different view of what's going on. In fact, I might even float up 100 feet over myself and look down at myself and feel differently about my problem then. That's my problem down there. That's a different feeling. You can visualize these things and change the way you feel and think by having a different perception. And sometimes even that can be enough. You know, another dissociative process that I learned in NLP is sitting in the movie theater watching your life unfold on the screen. So if you had some sort of traumatic event, you watch a movie of that traumatic event and you're sitting in the theater safe, maybe eating popcorn or not. (laughs) You're just watching everything unfold and it's happening up there on the screen. And how do you feel? Connect with those feelings. Is it just as powerful? Is it less powerful? And if you still feel negative about it, how about you're in the projector booth looking down at yourself in the theater watching yourself on the screen. Kind of a double dissociation there. You're dissociating once from the screen and then once from yourself sitting in the theater. And how about putting yourself outside the theater? How about putting yourself on the moon looking down at Earth knowing that you're down there somewhere suffering but here you are away from all your problems. I do that sometimes. I look down at the Earth in my mind and know that I'm down there somewhere But my problems are so minuscule from this perspective that they don't matter. And I feel differently about them. One of many, many, many techniques that you can do just to help you feel better about something. I'm not saying it's going to resolve everything and your problems go away. But to be able to get through a suffering moment of time and not have it defeat you, not have it make you buckle and bow down to its intensity, it can be liberating. Dissociation is one of those techniques where you separate from yourself and see yourself over there having the experience. If that person can have the experience, then you can witness it. You know, children do this. When they're in abusive or traumatic situations, children have been known, and including my girlfriend, my girlfriend went through this when she was a child, children have been known to dissociate so that their body and their mind is suffering over there. But they're over here completely separated. And in my opinion, this is why uh, a lot of children that have suffered trauma don't remember the trauma. They remember the feeling. They remember something, something happened, but they don't remember exactly what that was. They can't bring up the visual. They can't bring up the auditory. They know something happened, but they were disconnected from their senses back then. So yes, in my opinion, I believe you can walk around in life with the feeling that something just isn't right because something traumatic happened that you might have dissociated from when you were younger. Now, I don't want you to make you think, oh, that must have happened to me if you're carrying something around. It may or may not be. But I just want to introduce that concept, that idea, in case you've never thought of it, that if you're carrying around something that you've not been able to identify, maybe it is something that you dissociated from when you were younger and now you're trying to deal with it as an adult because... Anything repressed eventually comes up. Anything blocked out eventually unblocks and comes up to be processed. And this is when it's helpful to talk to that other part of you. Or at least this is one of the techniques. Let's talk to that part that feels X. Sad, angry, upset. And find out what it wants. Find out why it's so upset. So anyway, there's a lot to dive into with that. I'm going to get into um, how you can do this with yourself after the email uh, I read right after this. We'll be right back. Talk to you shortly. All 
All right, I mentioned the safe empowerment system right at the beginning of the show. That is for anyone that is experiencing anxiety or social anxiety. Uh, I know I lump those in every now and then. It's not the same thing, but social anxiety is, you know, dealing with your fears or not wanting to be in social situations, that awkward feeling. And if you're uncomfortable being in social situations, then uh, the safe empowerment system, that's what I made it for. That's what this is all about, is just to help you through those social situations because social situations aren't going to disappear. They're going to be around forever. And if that scares you, then maybe it's time to do something about it uh, and start feeling better about those situations. And even if you have regular anxiety where it's not about social situations, but it's about other things, just being able to connect with yourself. And, you know, I talked about parts being able to connect with those parts of yourself and be at peace, come to a resolution, come to a more clear space inside you, a more peaceful place inside you can make all the difference in the world. So I want you to consider getting the safe empowerment system for social anxiety over at quietbegins.com. This may be what you're looking for if you carry anxiety around with you. I know a lot of people do. I know I used to quite a bit. But check it out. Go to quietbegins.com. You can hear an audio sample of it and you can read the page and see if it's the perfect thing for you. All right, welcome back. I'm going to read you this email that I received quite a while back, but uh, this is the time I wanted to talk about the subject. So I finally pulled out the email from the distant past. Here it comes. This person I'm going to call Tim. Tim writes, hey, John, (laughs) which I think he's thinking about someone else. I hope you're having a great weekend. Here's my challenge. For more than two decades, I've struggled with an issue I can't get a handle on. I don't believe I'm going too far when I say it's affected every area of my life from relationships to career to how I spend my free time. The issue may be related related to my treatment of unwanted thoughts and feelings. I began noticing these in my teens and would push them away. I would suppress and repress them. However, I didn't link that to the effects that I now deal with on a daily basis until today, which are a slight pressure in my gut or head, seemingly no automatic thought process, thinking is a chore and must be deliberate conscious action, persistent internal restlessness that something is wrong, but unable to define what, my emotional state seems undefinable. Mostly, I just feel the pressure I mentioned above. And that's kind of it. And I've been in the state since I was a teen. I thought it's how everyone felt. In my 20s, I had a couple moments where the pressure released, not sure why. And I knew this was not normal. I did some research and boiled down the issue to obsession. So I went to OCD therapy in my early 30s, and that helped to a degree, I guess but my mind and emotions were still muted. Then I tried a nutritionist, and that too seemed to help to a degree. I actually had some breakthroughs in my ability to think and feel, but those were short-lived, and I couldn't put my finger on exactly what was working one time and why it wasn't working in another. So while nutrition seemed to be the key, it wasn't the whole thing. I eat whatever I want now. And for the past two years, I've put myself in therapy again. This time I'm using the internal family system construct. And again, I don't know why it works, and sometimes it doesn't. And if you're not sure what IFS is, it's a system where you talk to the different parts that make up you. Your thoughts and emotions are considered a different part. The point is to talk to the exile parts and unburden them of their pain, which in turn released you from the harmful habits, etc. Let me add that every breakthrough brought freedom to my mental and emotional state and also opened me up to the wanted thoughts and feelings. I would then resist those thoughts and wind up in a numbed state. Strangely, I don't even know what my unwanted thoughts are, which makes it difficult to sit with or dig into what it is. Anyway, I'd really appreciate your take on this and what I could do to free up my mind. It's honestly felt like such a waste of a life, being in a mental prison. And time is short, and I'd like to try to make up some of that time. Okay, Tim, thank you so much for sharing that. Yes, one thing that you said right at the beginning about suppressing thoughts and repressing emotions is that you can absolutely have those manifest in other ways when you get older. And so, you know, the first place I go with this is when did it start? That's usually where we can resolve this problem is when did it start? Oh, it started when I was six or it started when I was 16. What was happening around that time when it started? You know, whatever your answers are, 
are going to be vital because at that point is when you made the decision to suppress or repress. And at that moment, you learn to do it and get better at it over time. But remembering when it started helps you connect with that part of yourself back then and understand why you started it in the first place. So this could be a part of you or not, but when you think about when it started, it can help you connect with yourself back then. For example, um, when I used to be a massive people pleaser and I had no boundaries, I can look back and ask myself, okay, when did that start? Well, gee, that started when I was one because that's when my stepfather walked into the picture and I feared him because of his drinking. All right, that, let's talk to that part of me that is still one. That sounds a little strange, but what happens when I do? I'll ask that one-year-old a question. Hey, why are you doing this? Why do you feel like you can't honor yourself? Why do you feel like you need to be nice to everyone and never say what you really want to say? And the answers will come. The answers will come up and I'll hear my one-year-old self say, if I say anything, he'll hurt me. You know what's going to happen when you start connecting with that younger version of you? You're going to start resolving some things inside of you. You're going to start healing some things inside of you. And you're going to get to a point where you won't have to suppress anything anymore. You can be your authentic self. Now, I'm way, way oversimplifying this. But just knowing or even guessing when you started doing this behavior can help you start resolving it can help you start healing from it and the more tears the better (laughs) if you can have a breakdown from this and cry about it or have some sort of emotional release or that shift I was talking about before this is going to help tremendously because yes even in my coaching I like to address behavior that you do today that causes you to stay where you are like we don't even have to visit your past sometimes Because maybe you've been there a thousand times and nothing's changed. So let's look at behavior today and why you do it today and find out what happens when you change that behavior because you'll get different results. I'd like to be in that area. It's it's not always fun to visit the past or maybe you're bored of visiting the past because you've been to therapy a thousand times. So instead of visiting the past, let's talk about today's behavior and why you do it. That's absolutely a very beneficial thing to do. If you look at why you do behavior today that doesn't make you feel empowered and then you change that behavior, you'll get different results. You'll get a different outcome. And even if the people or the uh, environment doesn't change for you, you change inside of you. Because instead of saying the things that you used to say or doing the things that you used to say, you do something different that's more in alignment with your character, your integrity, and who you want to be, your life has no choice but to change. So this is why it isn't always necessary to go into the past. But if you've worked on this stuff today and you are changing behavior and you're still doing everything possible that you can think of to honor yourself and be in alignment with your integrity and your character, then maybe it is in the past. Maybe you are holding on to something. Maybe that younger you is driving the bus. Maybe that's the person you need to connect with. Maybe that's the part of you that is causing conflict or resistance or some sort of challenge inside of you, and you need to get through it. Now, here's what I've learned about the part of you that is running the show, or at least sometimes. Sometimes as a part of you running the show, that part of you believes it's doing the right thing. He or she really believes they're doing the right thing. There's always some benefit that they think they're getting doing the behavior they do. This happens over and over. I've never seen it not happen. When there is some sort of conflict or resistance or a part of us doesn't agree or doesn't want to or doesn't feel good about it, there's usually something that they believe they're doing that's positive for you. So this is like one of the steps in talking to yourself is understanding what benefit they bring to you or what benefit they think they're bringing to your life. And a good example of that is somebody who always sabotages their own fun. They're out having fun and then a part of them says, you shouldn't be having fun. 
and then they feel miserable or they can't get through that fun moment anymore, feeling free to laugh and enjoy themselves because a part of themselves said, you shouldn't be having fun. And they don't know why it happens. Maybe they know that their mom used to say that. Maybe they know that it used to be that way, but why is it happening today? Why am I holding on to this? Okay, well, let's go through the process. If we're talking about uh, if we think there's a part of us that is causing us some sort of suffering or pain or limiting us in some way, let's talk to that part. Let's ask the question, when did this start? When did you start doing this? And you'll probably come up with an age. And even if you don't, make one up. This is just mind stuff. We're just playing with the thought processes that we have to understand ourselves better and finding out what is going on in there so we can step outside of our own problem to understand the problem. So, yes, let's find out. When did this start? It's a great question. Find out the age range and come up with something. I mean, you may not know how it started or why it started, but just think about when did you start doing this behavior? where you are having fun and then you go, no, 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 I shouldn't have any fun in this example. So let's just say this person says, I I was 10. And the second question might be, well, why did you start doing this behavior? And what answer do you come up with there? And let's let's just say that this person said, I started doing it because my mom told me to be very careful when I am having fun because I could hurt myself. It may not be that revealing for you. But let's just say that this person came up with that. My mom said a long time ago that I have to be careful because I could hurt myself. And then the next question might be, well, what benefit does that bring to your life? And you may not come up with an answer right away, but I want you to think of how it benefits you to do that behavior. What benefit? You know, I want to have fun. I, I should be able to have fun. Okay, but what benefit does it bring to you to not have fun, to stop yourself from having fun? And you might have to think a little bit. In this case, maybe this person's answer is, well, if I stop myself from having fun, then I'll be more mindful of staying safe, staying out of trouble, uh, not getting hurt. And this might be very helpful for you to understand about yourself. It's not that you're not having fun anymore. It's that maybe there's a level of protection in there that served you at one time to protect yourself or to feel like you had to protect yourself. How does that serve you is a good question. How does this behavior serve me? I really need you to find the benefit. If you haven't found the benefit of your behavior, I need you to find one because that is the important part because you won't do behavior unless it benefits you in some way. And even if I'm not right about that, just adopt that belief to get through this process, to get through the questioning so that you can figure out why you can't stop doing the behavior. Even addicts who are killing themselves with powerful drugs or alcohol know there's a benefit to doing it. It makes them high in the moment, feel better in the moment. They see it as a benefit. Okay, why do you want to feel better? Or in the way I worded it earlier, how does it serve you? And you come up with an answer. And so for you, Tim, that's what I would ask myself, all those questions. When did this start? And what behavior do I do today that is related to when it started? Let me give you an example from my life. When I used to be highly judgmental toward my wife when I was married, I had to go through this process of when did this start? When did I start being judgmental? And I thought of a very early age because my stepfather was a volatile source of toxicity and dysfunction in my life that I did not want that in my life ever again. And so I connected with that younger self inside of me And figured out that I made a choice back then. Even if I wasn't conscious of it, I made a choice that I wasn't going to allow toxic people into my life. Or especially toxic behavior. And it was going to be from specific people. The ones that were closest to me. The ones I got into relationships with. And so I decided that I was going to speak up and be judgmental, be critical about other people's behavior Hey, you're going to drink that alcohol. Hey, you're going to eat those sweets. Hey, you're going to smoke a cigarette. Hey, this, hey, that. I became critical of their behaviors because I didn't want that in my life. And I had to put the pieces together to figure out that my judgments, my criticisms toward them were causing them to be unhappy around me. And that was bad behavior, but how do I stop it? And so this is when I talked to that younger self and tried to figure out if what existed then still applied. 
and this is the next step, is to ask yourself, does what existed back then still apply today? Am I still this frightened child in a relationship with someone who is very dangerous to be around? And if you can't substantiate today's behavior and correlate that behavior to your circumstances, your environment, your relationships today, then your behavior today is pointless, or at least the behavior that is causing outcomes that you don't want. Me being judgmental in my marriage was pointless because what am I protecting myself from? I don't have to protect myself from that anymore. She's not dangerous. She's not the problem. At this point, I'm the problem. I'm the toxic one. And that helps shift my perspective. That helps shift a perception inside of me that I think the world is a problem because that was my world when I was younger. But now I'm an individual in this world with safer people because I got out of that toxic situation and I don't need to think the same way. How do I get out of my old pattern of thinking so that I can solve the problem outside the way I used to think? And so going through this process of talking to yourself, talking to that part of yourself from the past, after you talk about how their behavior benefits you, the next step is to ask them what aspects of their behavior that benefit you would you like to keep and what aspects would you not like to keep? What aspects would you like to kind of let go? And what this does is it acknowledges some of that behavior inside your younger self. It validates you. You look back at a younger version of yourself and you say, hey, you know what? That behavior has benefited both of us for all this time. However, some of it doesn't work anymore and some of it really benefits us. And I want to keep the stuff that benefits us. And what's interesting is that that part of you can look back at you and say, you know what? Some of your behavior benefits me too. And when you can see the benefit in each other, that's when the integration can start to begin. Again, this is a much, much deeper process with a very specific way to do things. And I've skipped some steps, but I wanted to give you the basic idea because you can do this on your own. You can talk to this part of yourself and figure out the behavior that benefits you. And they can look at you and figure out what behavior benefits them. And then you can work together and start to integrate your processes, start to integrate who you are with who they are so that they don't feel so alone, so that they're not tackling the world alone. When I was judgmental all the time, that was me as a child, my child self, running my life. I was a little boy running my marriage. And when I was able to merge that little boy with who I am today and take the positive aspects of that little boy and give him the positive aspects of my adult self and integrate and work together, it really changed my life. And it helped me not be so scared and see the world from this tiny little perspective that I had. It broadened my horizons. And so this is something you can use for yourself and start to understand yourself better. Maybe change some behaviors. Maybe reach an entire new level of being and thinking and feeling so that you can move forward in a more positive way. And for you, Tim, let me come back to your letter. I love the fact that um, there's a therapy for this. I didn't even know there was. Uh, you said it's internal family system, and that's pretty interesting because I know of a few modalities that do some type of inner child work. This is kind of what it reminds me of. And also uh, parts work that you're talking about. And um, some modalities will discuss, okay, there's a organizer part of you, and there's a record keeper part of you, and there's a sabotaging part of you, and there's other modalities that get into really deep stuff. I don't like to go into that deep and all these archetypes and things like that. But for some people, it has been phenomenal. For my girlfriend, it's been phenomenal to talk to all the parts of herself and get them in alignment and try to figure out what's going on. It's been really helpful for her and for other people as well. So there are modalities out there that deal with parts. And I've given you kind of the basic overview of what you can do to talk to your part or parts. Because sometimes there's more than one. And uh, another question I didn't actually raise, but it's helpful to know what this part looks like just in case it's somebody from your past. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, but sometimes the part that's running the show isn't even you. It's somebody else. It's your mom, it's your dad, it's your brother, your sister. It's someone that had a big effect on you. And then you realize, oh, that part telling me that I shouldn't go on this trip 
sounds like my mother, sounds like my father, sounds like so-and-so, my ex-girlfriend, my ex-husband. It can be any one of those people, and then you can start to differentiate your voice from theirs. It's helpful if you get that inner dialogue in your head and you realize, oh, that's not even my voice. I don't have to listen to them. What are you doing in my head? I put you there. I'm keeping you there. I don't have to have you there. That can be helpful. So for you, Tim, I think the the parts therapy or whatever you call it, the internal family systems therapy has probably been very helpful to you. But like you said, I'm still in this space. I'm still feeling like I'm an emotional, I'm in this mental prison. You know, my process for that is to look at everything in my life. I talked about this, I think recently, uh, but definitely on a, a previous show where I start eliminating these things in my life, not for real, but just in my mind. So I think about, okay, I have this job. What would happen if I didn't have that job? Do I feel better? Because if I do, that's a step in the right direction. What would happen if I didn't have this partner? What would happen if I didn't have my mom, my dad, my sister, my brother? You know, eliminate these people in your mind. Eliminate the environments that you're in. Eliminate the places you go, the people you see, the things you do. And you just take these things out one at a time. The process of elimination until you figure out which one makes you lightest and happiest. And you get to the point where whatever was bothering you is suddenly not there anymore. What would happen if I didn't have that car that broke down all the time? Oh my God, I wouldn't have to deal with that anymore. Jeez, that would feel so good. That could be true. What would happen if you never had to go to another family reunion? Oh my God, I feel so light. I feel so free. I never have to deal with those people again. I hope that's not you, but you know, it can happen. We can eliminate these things in in our mind and figure out what makes us happy. Because what usually happens is we have something that makes us unhappy and we don't include it in our assessment because we just have to deal with it. We just have to know it's a given and there's nothing we can do about it, so we deal with it. We haven't come to a place of acceptance, which would be great. Can't always do it. We just have to realize that, oh, this is somebody I have to continue dealing with. Nothing I can do about it. But what happens in your mind when you do the process of elimination and you find out that when that person is out of your life, suddenly you don't have any problems? What if that was the case? So that's what I'd recommend is going through each and every person, place, or thing and taking it out of your life in your mind's eye and figure out if that gets you closer and closer to the place you want to be. Now, let's just say you do that. You took everything out. Then maybe you have to go in your past and ask yourself, okay, what would need to change in my past in order for me to feel good inside today? So that might be helpful too. Tim, I don't know if this is going to be the perfect episode for you or not, but hopefully this was enough information to give you something to work with or anyone listening now is giving you something to work with to help yourself figure out what's going on in my life. Why does this keep happening? Or why do I keep feeling this way to get past that and into a better space? Again, I hope this has been helpful. Thank you so much for joining me today. Great talking with you. Be right back after this. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to remind you to head to quietbegins.com if you're sick and tired of anxiety. I know. I am too. (laughs) Quietbegins.com, the safe empowerment system for social anxiety. And I want to thank the patron members over at patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. If you're supporting the show, I appreciate you. You are the reason this show keeps going. And if you find value in this show and you want to show your support, head over to patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. I appreciate you, patron members. Thank you. And this is the last week I'm doing this survey, if you haven't heard about it. If you're in a relationship, I want to know how you met your significant other. And I want to know the circumstances and how things evolved. And it's all anonymous. Everything's private. I don't don't ask for your name or your email or anything like that. I just want to collect information for those who are single, who have no idea how to meet a significant other. So I would love for you to take a survey. Head over to theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash survey. Share your experience. It's going to help a lot of people. 
And I want to remind you of my other show, Love and Abuse. Head over to loveandabuse.com. This is for anyone in a difficult relationship. I mean, this show talks about relationships as well, but this really gets into the deeper, more unhealthy aspects of a relationship when you just can't seem to get along, when there's guilt trips thrown back and forth, when there's passive aggressiveness, when there's lying or deception or manipulation, all kinds of things that we might do in a relationship when things aren't going as well as they should or if they're just way too complex and we don't know why. That's where the Love and Abuse podcast kicks in. And of course, you'll find the mean workbook over at loveandabuse.com. And that is the assessment and healing guide for a difficult relationship. So if you're not sure if you're in a difficult relationship, maybe it's time to find out. Or if you're having a great time, then maybe it's not the show for you. But either way, it's educational. And for most people that listen, and especially those who get the mean workbook, it can be very enlightening. So when you get a chance, head over to loveandabuse.com. And finally, I'd like to thank Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in the overwhelmed brain. Now for the person who wrote the email, Tim, I'm going to go the opposite direction. I told Tim one of the steps you can do to figure out why your life doesn't feel as fulfilling as it could be or what you're holding on to, any kind of repressed emotions or anything like that. What I said before is that you can do a process of elimination. If I take this out of my life, how does it feel? If I take this out of my life, how does it feel? There's also the opposite way you can go, which is a process of including or adding something to your life. So visualizing what's going on in your life right now and how you feel uh, overall in general. uh, What is your level of fulfillment? What is your level of satisfaction? What is your level of happiness and peace and comfort? or any other words that work for you that give you a positive feeling. If you're not feeling 100%, it doesn't mean you ever will. I'm not saying that everyone can be 100% all the time. I think life throws us challenges and it's bound to happen and we got to deal with them as they come. But as we go through our learning and healing and growing, we can be better prepared for the challenges that come our way. However, Sometimes we just have this underlying feeling we can't get rid of. So I mentioned the visualization of the process of elimination. You can also visualize what can I add to my life that would make a difference. And I don't want you to jump into the immediate obvious answers like I'm single and I just need a partner. That's too obvious. It's too big picture or I'm broke and I need money too obvious, too big picture. I mean, yes, that would be great and it might solve a lot of things, but I like you to ask the question, what about having that would be fulfilling, would make me feel better? What about having money? What about having a partner? What about whatever it is for you would make life more fulfilling? So A, think about what you can add to your life that not only would make your life better, but how about the moment better? Let's really drill down and ask ourselves, what do I need in this moment? Like I used to use the magic pill concept. Like if I could take a magic pill that would do anything for me, what would it do? And I took that virtual magic pill when I was sad one day and I realized I just need some sleep. And uh, when I thought about getting sleep, just thinking about it made me feel better. So that magic pill idea works in a lot of cases, but how about just asking yourself, what can I add to my life in this moment to make things better, to make me happier, to make me more comfortable, to make me feel more confident in myself, more secure in myself? What could I add to my life right now to do that? And find out what you come up with. And it may turn into something that you can add to your life every day, and you may not be able to add it. You may think of something that you can't add Like, I want this person who died, I want them back in my life. That might be impossible. But when it becomes impossible in your mind, when you can't have what you want, then you ask the second question, which is, what about that makes me feel better? What about that makes me feel more comfortable, more secure, more everything, more comfortable, more happy, more at peace? If that person was back in my life, what about having that person makes me feel better? What about having that job? What about having more money makes me feel X, Y, Z? And that what about question really dives underneath the reason you want it. Because 
you know, a lot of people, let's just say, want to be millionaires. They want a lot of money. But what about having that money makes things better? Well, you might say, well, it gives me more options. It helps me pay for my medical bills. It helps me go on vacation. Well, let me ask you this. Let's just say that you told me that it was all about getting more time off. Maybe it's not the money. Maybe it's just the fact that you're not as healthy as you want to be. Again, I'm not saying that this is going to lead to the ultimate answer and everything's going to be fine, although it could, but knowing the whatabouts about something can really help start to define what is going on in your life at the micro level instead of the big picture level of, well, I don't have enough money, so my life sucks, (laughs) or I don't have the love of my life and my life sucks. That is hard to wrap your brain around, but you can wrap your brain around something tangible, something direct, something more specific. And that's why I like the what about questions. So play with that. See where you get. This is uh, good to practice. It's something that could be that little bit of shift to help you move in a different direction as opposed to thinking, well, I'm always broke or I'm always single. I'm always this. I'm always that. And who knows? Maybe you already know all your problems and you know there's nothing you can do and you feel like it's hopeless. I don't want you to lose hope. I want you to remember that Everything happens in waves. Sometimes you're in the valleys, sometimes you're on the peaks. But these waves come and go. Sometimes they last a day, sometimes they last 10 years. And sometimes they disappear just because you decided to work on something in yourself and heal. And you've suddenly opened a door that wasn't there before. And when that happens, that's pretty cool. No matter what, always keep an open mind so that you can step into your power. This will help you be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure and above all. And this is something I absolutely know to be true about you. You are amazing. Amazing.